So hello, I'm happy to see everyone here. Um, we're gonna begin just to make sure, can everyone hear me? Just give me a thumbs up just to make sure that everything here is good. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Shuvi. I've been emailing you um, the last few days and I'm really excited to start this new series, this new webinar series. With me here today are a few people from the NLI and I'll introduce just a couple of people uh, quickly. And also uh, Lior Hameiri who's here from the Israel Engagement from UJ Toronto. Thank you Lior for, you can wave, for your uh, partnership on this project. And with me are also uh, Michal and Dara who work with me in the, in the library. They're here for you um, in the chat box for any technical or other questions during the session. Um, I'm just gonna say um, that we have a lot to, uh, to accomplish in this one hour that we have together and I'm very mindful of the time we have, it's very valuable. So um, I'm gonna pause a, a few times during the session for some short comments or a question or two, but you will have a feedback form in the end and there you'll see there'll be plenty of other ways for you to express yourself during the session. Um, less verbally um, in the, in the uh, gallery view of everyone speaking to each other, but that's actually part of what we're trying to accomplish today is to sort of explore new ways of how to have a discussion, especially online with so many participants. So hopefully you'll find that valuable and something that you can also use with your learners in the different environments that you teach or work. Um, so here we are. Um, having our first session about the Rabin Memorial Day. I'll also refer to it during the session as Yom Rabin, uh, as it's called in Hebrew. Um, what will we be doing today together? Well, um, we're going to be speaking a little bit about the complexities of Yom Rabin in Israeli society. Um, and we will see how NLI or the National Library of Israel Resources can help us facilitate a discussion on this topic and others. This will just be modeling how you can use NLI resources to really uh, facilitate a discussion about any topic. Um, and at the end of this session, you'll get this whole presentation with very useful links also attached where you can um, go and search and, and get to know our resources um, in a much broader way. And of course, in the coming sessions, we'll be talking about other issues and other days. But here you're going to have some more concrete examples for Yom Rabin. We're also going to experience as learners and also think about as educators, some pedagogic tools that you can use in your learning. And we're going to, again, be mindful about how to maximize our group learning here together. So here we go. What is the NLI or the National Library of Israel? Um, I sent you a short video in the email and I hope you all wa watched it. And if not, if you didn't have a chance, you can watch it later. Um, the, basically the NLI was established in 1892. It was not established when the, the state of Israel was founded, but rather um, it actually started as um, the institution of, the, um, of preserving national memory. This was way before um, people started even thinking about um, the state of Israel as, uh, as an entity we know today. And basically it's, um, its main mission is to serve a home for the collections and um, the archives of the Jewish people. Um, and in that sense, I think that the NLI is not just another library. It really is the treasures of the Jewish people. And it serves not only the Israeli public, but the Jewish world at large. And I think that a lot of what we're gonna be doing today uh, comes to show how the National Library can be relevant and useful to Jews all around the world, learning about their history, learning about their culture, and actually helping us to preserve their stories and their culture in uh, different places in the world. Um, so what is in the NLI or in the National Library of Israel? Um, multiple, of course, you can see here multiple uh, books and manuscripts, but not only books uh, live in the library. Um, in the NLI, we have um, many, many uh, other kinds of artifacts and manuscripts and um, ephemera that it really makes this library very, very special. And again, it really holds the, the treasures and the memories of many, many uh, communities around the world and from different times in history, including music and photographs and things that you might not necessarily find in other libraries in the world. Um, 
Today we're going to be talking about the notion of machloket, of dispute or argument. And there's a very famous quote from the Mishnah um, that uh, relates to machloket or dispute. And the, it go, and the quote goes like this, every dispute that is for the sake of heaven will in the end endure, but one that is not for the sake of heaven will not endure. Um, now, this is a little bit counterintuitive because when we think of arguments or conflicts, I think our, um, usually our tendency is to want to resolve uh, the conflicts and not um, live in a state of argument or dispute with the people who live around us, with our environment. Um, but here we have a very interesting idea where machloket actually is almost a value in, in Jewish culture. Um, and we'll see that today we're going to be speaking about a day that not only uh, deals with machloket, um, Yom Rabin, and we'll, we'll see how that, um, uh, how that came about. But also there's quite a lot of dispute about the actual day, and we'll break that down in a few moments. Um, I just want to maybe clarify something about how we're going to be working together today, um, since um, I know that many of you are educators and you work in the field with learners or with communities. Some of you might work um, in organizations and you might not be um, a teacher in a classroom per se, but I think that a lot of the things we're going to be speaking about can enrich um, uh, anyone. And definitely, I, I, I really hope that uh, you pass this on to more educators that you know. And I think um, uh, it's really important to find that link also to the things that um, are happening in Israeli society and to sort of get the, an, inside, an insider's glimpse into um, how things um, uh, unfolded in Israeli society around Yom Rabin. Um, I do encourage you again to um, write us in the chat box if you have any specific questions. Um, but I do wanna make it clear that it's, this isn't gonna be a Zoom uh, tutorial per se. I'm actually not gonna even be using breakout rooms or methods like that during this session. And it's actually very uh, intentional because I wanna show you that we can use quote unquote old school kind of um, uh, um, methods through online learning that can really benefit our learners and the process of learning. So what we're gonna be doing today is actually having some disputes or arguments or discussions, um, and you'll see how it'll all come about. So um, like I was saying, this is a little counterintuitive, like why preserve conflict? And um, I think that many of us as educators and as leaders would think, how do we know when the right time is to embrace that conflict and disagreement, but when it is the right thing to do to resolve and uh, uh, conflict and bridge our differences? So that reminded me a little bit about the famous saya saying, um, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Or I could tell you that these days I'm in need of a lot of coffee and other, and other things to help me sort of balance all of the challenges we're dealing with these days. And I think that um, many times we're looking for that answer, like when is this a discussion in the classroom or between friends or in the, in the family that we really want to sort of say, you know, enough, this, you know, this isn't going anywhere and we really shouldn't be arguing about this. And when are the moments when we say, wow, this is a really important conversation. We really should continue speaking. And just by virtue of speaking to each other and, and not giving up, um, we're sort of showing that we have a bond of trust with that other person. And we're confident that we can talk things through, even if we disagree, we can agree to disagree, but we don't give up. Something about stopping to talk to someone, um, represents maybe giving up on the relationship. And I, I just wanna say that's true of Israeli society. And these days we see a lot of tension in, the, in Israeli society and in, and in other countries. Um, and it's true also of the communication between Jewish communities around the world, I think. That as long as we keep our conversation going, that really shows that we're still in this together. Um, and what I would like to do is now um, is to show you a little bit about the disputes or arguments that were, um, that came to be around Yom Rabin itself. So what's the debate about Yom Rabin? So first of all, um, this is a photograph taken from um, a collection we have in the NLI, um, uh, it's called Dan Hadani Collection. It's, he's a photographer who took this picture. And um, we see this poster of the uh, Oslo Accords with Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat shaking hands. For some people, that image really is an, the epitome of striving for peace and looking for a solution and um, trying to um, 
really uh, solve a conflict between Jews and Palest uh, Israelis and Palestinians. And here we have a poster that says partners to murder, meaning someone else reads that image as something that is actually very negative. And that leads to um, the main debate around Yom Rabin is the actual events themselves. What the tensions that were in Israeli society at the time, um, a lot of feeling of mistrust and accusations all over the place. And I'm talking even uh, before the assassination of Rabin, meaning the tensions that were in Israeli society at the time, things were very, very heated. Um, personally, I was a senior, I was in 12th grade at the time, and I have a very, very vivid memory of that night. Um, I was actually babysitting and um, I basically was watching the news or watching something and then this comes up on TV and I was really shocked. Um, there was this like feeling of chaos um, at the time and right after the assassination, there were many, many mutual accusations from the left or from the right. Was this a, an individual's um, doing? Was this just Yigal Amir doing what he thought was right, but he didn't, he wasn't representing anyone else? Or was his action actually mirroring something very um, toxic that was happening in Israeli society and that maybe there were people who supported what he did? And of course, as many of you know, the tensions only grew after these events. Um, another part of the debate around Yom Rabin is actually connected to the date itself. Here we have an image of a calendar actually from a community in Jamaica in 1798, um, showing us the Israeli, the, the um, uh, Hebrew dates and the um, uh, dates in English and their, how they correspond to the dates on the regular calendar. And the truth is, I don't know if many of you know this, but the actual date of um, uh, the assassination of Yom Rabin, of uh, uh, Vitzchak Rabin was on November 4th. 1995, and, and that year, that was the 12th of Cheshvan. But after the assassination, there was a huge debate about whether or not that day should be commemorated on the on November 4th or on Yudbet Cheshvan. Now you might say, it's a small detail, it's a small question, what does it matter? It happened at a certain on a certain day and we're gonna commemorate it for years to come. But it actually took two years till the second anniversary of the assassination for the decision to be made, and today it is commemorated officially in Israel on Yud Bet Cheshvan, which comes out on a different date, uh, usually in November, but on a different date in November every year. There are actually some people who still commemorate it on November 4th. Now, why is this such an important question? Um, as you might, as you can assume, uh, the Hebrew date uh, in the Hebrew calendar has significance and the question of whether or not in the state of Israel we commemorate events and um, other uh, and things that happen in uh, in the state of Israel on the on the Hebrew date or on uh, the date the, from the Gregorian calendar is a big question for some people it was critical for it to be um, on either one of them and what's also interesting is that on Yud Aleph Cheshvan the eleventh of Cheshvan the day before what is now commemorating the uh, uh, assassination of Yitzhak Rabin is the day of um, uh, Rachel Imenu, uh, Rachel from the Bible. Um, she, uh, her, her um, your site is on the 11th of Cheshvan. Now you would think, again, this is a little petty detail, but for some schools and for some communities, it really posed a conflict between what do we commemorate on this week or on these two days that we have and it sort of um, complicated the situation where they had to choose whether or not they're going to invest their time and their educational resources in um, the day Yom Rabin or the day of the Yorzeit of Rachel Imenu. So um, it did have some significance and again ultimately the day has it was decided that it would be on the 12th of Cheshvan. Uh, this comes this leads to the next debate of, about Yom Rabin which is what really is the educational focus of this day? Is this a day about Yitzhak Rabin, the man, the man who really, um, he's the epitome of the Israeli, came, uh, uh, born in Israel, fought in the wars. He was, uh, he had a, a, a very, um, um, a, a really important military um, career. He was a politician. He really, um, for many, many people, he's like a symbol of, 
the successful Israeli um, who contributes to society, who's done so much. Um, is that what we're commemorating on this day or are we commemorating the assassination itself? The tensions that led to it, the, this terrible deed of someone taking, um, taking, making the decision to kill a prime minister of Israel, a, a fellow Jew. And for many years, there was a lot of tension around uh, the educational focus of this day. Um, schools in different sectors of Israeli uh, society were struggling with how to commemorate this day to the extent that some people felt that um, putting the emphasis on Yitzhak Rabin's life was a mistake because it made uh, people who didn't, um, who couldn't uh, sympathize or didn't agree with his, um, with his opinions, it made it really hard for them to commemorate this day and sort of make that connection and be engaged. And as the years went by, that day, this day has become more and more a day about democracy, about how to have civil discourse, about taking responsibility for our words. And here you have an example of a poster that was um, uh, designed um, for, there's a competition every year um, through the Robin Center for designing uh, posters that, that relate to the day and what their message is. And here there's a really, uh, uh, a very vivid example of how words can kill. Um, so we have the, the keyboard in the shape of a, of a pistol, of, a, of a, um, a gun, and it really goes to show that this day really isn't about Rabin. I mean, of course, Rabin was a symbol. He was important. He was a leader. Um, but the emphasis in the long run for Israeli society is really about how we deal with conflict and how we settle our differences. So um, what I've shown you till now is really the three... Um, main debates around Yom Rabin. I'm um, going to stop sharing the screen for one second so we can see if there are any comments or questions at this point. Someone, if someone wants to say something before we move on. Okay, so we're going to continue. Um, what I want to ask you now, and I hope that you all are familiar with your key, your um, annotate function in the um, in your Zoom account. Um, if you, um, I don't know if you can see it on my screen, but there's something called annotate. Um, what I'd like for you to do, it's it's right next to the uh, share and on the same bar as the uh, uh, chat is. I'd like for you to put some kind of scribble or stamp or something indicating what your opinion is on this question. Should Yom Rabin be commemorated as a fast day? That was one of the um, suggestions around Yom Rabin that Israeli society should commemorate Yom Rabin as a fast day, just like other fast days that really symbolize destruction and chaos and tragedy in Jewish culture and Jewish history. All right, so I see there are a few people already writing their, um, scribbling their little or checking their uh, opinion on this scale. I'm encouraging a few more people to do so. Um, and in the meantime, what we're gonna do is we're gonna share in the chat a Google form. And I'm gonna ask you to fill out the Google form. It'll take you a, a minute or two. And then we'll regroup to see your responses on the Google uh, form. So take a minute to fill it out. Michal's gonna share it now in the chat box. Um, so as you'll notice, there's a Google form in the chat box. I'd like for you all to click on it and just fill it out, um, take a minute.
Okay, as you're filling out the form, I'm already sharing on the screen the responses, okay? It'll update while people continue to, um, to fill out the form. What I wanna suggest is that this is a very simple tool and I'm sure most of you are familiar with Google Docs and Google Forms and probably most of your learners as well. This is a very simple tool where I purposely um, phrased certain questions in a certain way with different options in the form so that as you can see, the graphics of how it looks is very different for each question. So first of all, you can get a glimpse of how many people are here from different places. Um, we have people from all over the world here and it's really exciting. Um, and also when it comes to seniority, we can see that a lot of people, more than a third of the people in this crowd are um, in education for around 30 years and that's amazing. And we have quite a lot of people who are also in education around 20 years in Jewish education. So the majority of you are really senior in, uh, educators and that's uh, really exciting to see how many people are here. Um, there's something about looking at this pie of, of the group for us as, as facilitators or educators, sometimes on a Zoom uh, meeting like this, we can't actually engage and speak to every single person participating. And it might be students that we know, it might be people that we don't know so well. And this is a really nice way of getting people to sort of feel the room and see who else is here. Um, this is something that you can also do in the beginning of a meeting. And it just gives you an, a sense of where you are also um, relative to the group. So it, um, it shows us a little bit about who's, who's uh, sitting in the room with us. Um, and let's look a little bit at this, um, at this graph for a second. On the question of, do you think Yom Rabin should be commemorated as a fast day? We saw the question of the scale, the yes and no. We had a few people writing yes, we had a few people writing no. Here, I don't know if you notice, but um, there are quite a lot of people in the middle. Um, right, two, three, and four uh, really represent the sort of people maybe who aren't so sure, um, don't have such a, a, a strong opinion on the topic. Um, and again, this is an anonymous form, so nobody has to feel intimidated by where they are. And I'm thinking of younger students who might sometimes hesitate um, when it comes to expressing their opinion. Here they have a chance to just say whatever it is they wanted to say. Again, they're saying it not by verbally expressing themselves, but by filling out this form. And they don't have to be worried or hesitant because they, um, anyone, someone is gonna say, oh, I can't believe you think that Yom Rabin should be a fast day or not. How could you say that? So that gives them a safe space to sort of say what they think and give them, it also gives them a sense when we look at the responses together um, at where they are, are they in a minority? Or, or is the majority of the people in the, in the class, in the group, uh, in agreement with them? It just gives them a sense of that. So on the question of um, is expressing your opinion um, on a scale a discussion, most of you think it is not a discussion. And most of you also think that the reason it isn't a discussion is because a discussion must include listening to other opinions. I just want you to notice that no one chose um, this reason, because without a group conversation, it's not a discussion, meaning most of you think that um, the basis of a good discussion or a real discussion is listening to other people. And a quarter of you um, also wrote that um, it's not just about saying yes and no about something, it's actually uh, explaining why you think so. Now let's look at this last graph. Um, we see that for uh, many of you, um, the values or the ideas that I put down on this Google form are actually extremely significant in your point of view. There's, um, we have quite a lot of people who think that tolerance in democratic society and learning from history and all the other various things that we're here are very, very important. Um, and um, again, I could have chosen other things. Sometimes it's actually uh, deliberate, a, an educator, a teacher or a facilitator can choose something that they think most people will probably say is not significant at all. And then we would probably see some more um, blue spots here. For instance, I didn't write here learning about Yitzhak Rabin. Um, I did write important figures in Israeli history. And I noticed that 
Um, there are some people think that that's not significant at all. There's one person who wrote that. We don't know who. But this is just an example of a, um, a way to sort of have, this is the beginning of a discussion um, to, some, to some extent. And this is sort of a way for us to think about um, what is a discussion and how can we find other ways to have a discussion, especially online, if we can't just sit and talk to each other. Um, and I want to point out that there are actually um, even some uh, advantages to having this kind of discussion. So first of all, it's immediate. You notice that in one minute, we all, everyone just sat for really, some of you, it took you only seconds to fill out that form. And we had the responses right on the board. Um, it's a democratic kind of uh, discussion because no one's, you know, um, pushing or uh, talking when someone else is, everyone has their own space to really um, write what they think. They're not really uh, being judged. So it's not like the person who's more shy will get less of a chance to speak. Um, rather, everyone can participate and it's not an issue. And here again, as teachers or educators, we can also expect full participation. We can say everyone has to fill out this form and we can't have anyone shy away from that. And in a discussion in the classroom or in any other forum, if it's in a community or even amongst adults, many times there's a few dominant people who are the ones that really take the lead and other people don't get a chance to talk. Um, I already mentioned about the anonymous part and how that may feel more comfortable. Um, we get a sense of the group and, and the mapping of the group. And there is an element of surprise because here, I didn't know what you were going to answer. And it was really interesting to see how things divided up. This kind of question in another group might have split half half and it would have been really interesting. And also for the group itself, it would be curious, everyone would be curious to see, wait a second, what do most people think about this topic? Um, so what I want you to do now is if we're talking about a discussion, what do you think are the characteristics of a good discussion? We've already seen that most of you agree that writing your opinion on a scale is not a good discussion. So I, I wanna suggest each one of you can write one characteristic of a good discussion in the chat box, this way we can all see. Um, and while you're writing that in the chat box, and I'm sure um, there'll be a few people who agree with each other and write similar things, I'm gonna pull up um, something that we uh, prepared in advance. And I'm assuming that some of the building blocks that you think are in a good discussion, we did too. So I'm gonna also open up the chat box um, so I can see. Um, so we have reasoning, which already came up. Um, we have diversity. We have ground rules. A, a good discussion isn't just a chaotic place where everyone just says what they want whenever they want. Having a good discussion really in, entails flexibility. There are few opinions. We learn from a discussion. There's dialogue. Uh, people said about listening, there's a passion in discussion. If we're really in a heated discussion, it shows that we're really, really into this topic. We have something important to say about it. We're convinced, but we also need to come open to listening to other people. It expands our horizons. If we had a good discussion in a classroom or in a group, we really feel like we left that room with something new to think about. And I think that it really sometimes isn't so easy, but we need to take a stand sometimes. And really think about what our opinion is. And sometimes when there's a discussion that really makes us, um, that forces us sometimes to take a stand to really think about what our opinion is and to be um, honest and to have integrity about what it is that we really think about a topic and not just shy away from voicing an opinion. So here are the building blocks. And I see that in the chat box, people have written many more things. Um, Michal, if you want, you can also read off a few things. Uh, from the chat box, maybe something that wasn't mentioned here. Um, so you're welcome to just chime in here. Uh, I'd love to find out what the three before me rule is that um, Stephanie said. I haven't heard of that one before. Um, there's a lot of active listening here. Room for silence. And equal airtime for both sides. Those are the main things that have come through here. Okay, great. Thanks. So if anyone wants to add like a, a sentence or an insight, um, now's a great time if you would like to share something really about how you think, what you think a good discussion is and maybe how to facilitate a good discussion from your experience.
if someone wants to say something. Okay, so I'm gonna give you an opportunity to say something in a different way. What we're gonna do now is um, in your chat box, you'll find a link to a Google page. This Google page is built similar to a Talmud page, which for is one of the um, main um, books of Jewish culture, the Talmud or the Gemara, um, which is basically built um, also visually in this way, where there's a, a central text, um, the text that's being discussed, there's a quote from the Mishnah, um, and then um, and more, um, more comments from uh, the Talmud itself. And then around the main, the center, uh, the text that's in the center, we have uh, a discussion basically and different commentaries about the issues that were raised on that page. We're gonna do something similar um, and sort of write our own Talmud page about a source that as you can see is a visual source. It's, um, it's a photograph of a graffiti wall that was created after the assassination in what's called today Kikar Rabin. It was called Kikar Manchei Israel. Um, and after the assassination, it was named after Rabin. Um, and it's uh, the location where Rabin was assassinated. And right after um, uh, that happened, people started just writing on the wall and created this spontaneous graffiti. And as you can see, first of all, there are different things written side by side. There's, um, it's an interesting uh, image um, to think about a graffiti wall also as Talmud and as a kind of a discussion. So you're welcome to open up the link and add your own thoughts, your questions. Um, my suggestion is if you're writing a question, write it in italics so we can see the difference between a comment and a question. And feel free to just take one of the uh, rubrics and start writing and even to uh, maybe write a response to someone else's comment or question, if you like. So I'm gonna give you a couple, uh, a minute or two to do that. And I'm gonna also share with you what the um, document looks like when it's coming to life. I just want to mention there is a link under the image where you can see the image much larger. You can zoom in on the NLI website. And there's also some information and some translation of things that are written on um, the graffiti wall. So if you like, you can go into that link while we're uh, here or at a later time. Um, I think the uh, some people are writing here about the Hebrew and what the number is, and it just um, I think it makes us appreciate that when we're looking at a text, not all of our learners um, have the same access to it. And that's also very important uh, to remember.
I just want to say that looking at this page come to life for me as, a, as an educator, this is just very exciting, like to see how it's almost like sitting in a classroom or sitting in a room with a group of learners and just see the different colors and the movement and how people are just writing and engaging with this text. Um, I see that someone accidentally um, erased our image, but we're going to try to get it back on. Um, in the meantime, as you can see, this is really just um, a taste of a method that you can use with your learners. Um, so I feel like we could have just spent another hour or two unpacking everything that is being written here. I'm going to remind you that you have this link to this uh, Google Doc. You're welcome to make a copy and, and then erase what's written and use it for your learners as a fresh, clean page or use um, any piece of this um, if you like. Uh, just keep in mind that everyone here is shared as editors and that's how you can write on it. Um, and also when you share with your learners, make sure they can edit the document, but then keep in mind that it has a life of its own. And if you wanna reuse it or you wanna import it to another um, group, then you need to make a copy and um, start from the beginning. Um, I know it's really hard, but I'm gonna um, sort of ask you to pause a little bit um, and look at um, what is being created here. Um, again, if somebody wants to also um, respond to something that someone else wrote, you're welcome to. Um, I see that some people have asked questions Maybe someone wants to attempt to answer a question that someone else has asked. Um, if you have any thoughts, um, and I also want to show you, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of the rest of this document, which we created for you and for you to use with your learners. I'm going to scroll down for a second. Of course, you have this link opened up on your tab in your computer. So, but look at if you're looking at the share screen you can see that um, we already have down here, and some people already, I guess, um, figured out that we have two more Talmud pages with texts that are also um, about Yom Rabin. And some people have already written some comments, and um, there's another quote here from uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. What I wanna just mention is that in the end of this um, session, we're gonna send you this presentation. Um, in uh, this presentation in the end, there are some links that can be useful to you. Um, and one of the links is to a lesson plan about Yom Rabin. It's not this plan, this lesson that I'm giving you now. It's not this session um, uh, exactly, but it does have all the text we've been using here. And it really gives you a, a, a thorough kind of a systematic um, lesson plan about Yom Rabin using these texts and additional texts. Um, and you're welcome, of course, to use that as well. And it comes with a source sheet and everything. So all the text that I've been using in this session appear in the lesson plan. And this way, if you do decide to use the lesson plan, you come with that much more background and experience. So um, what I wanna just say about this little exercise is that again, with a very simple tool, a Google Doc, which I think most of us use for many other functions, um, for work or for collaborating with our colleagues. Here we have um, a way of creating a discussion in a, a platform that really is challenging when it comes to verbal participation and creating a discussion between 10 or 20 or 30 and sometimes more people can really be challenging um, on Zoom. And many educators are speaking now about the challenges of Zoom and how we're really uh, enjoying seeing each other's faces, but it can be very tiring and um, really difficult to have a real discussion on Zoom. This is a way to sort of have everyone in the group express an opinion um, and be part and be engaged. And at the same time, um, it's not as uh, tedious and tiresome and, and it doesn't entail so much concentration like listening to people on Zoom for such a long time. Um, what I also want to say is that this is a kind of document that can be leveraged and used again by the educator, meaning this we're doing now for five minutes, um, but as an educator in a classroom or with a group of learners or in a community, I can actually use something like this for an ongoing conversation. 
I can use this as a platform for people to later choose one of the other students' um, responses to the image and then write a response to them. I can have them divide into groups according to the things that they've asked. I can have each learner ask a question and make a comment. Um, this is a document that you can save and, and refer back to at a later date with the learners after they learned another source or another text and they can reflect on what they wrote in the beginning of the process. Meaning there are multiple ways that you can use this very, very simple platform um, in order to enhance learning and in order to encourage discussion. Um, teachers in a classroom setting, I would even suggest you can um, write the students' names in the rubrics um, before they see the document. And then um, it takes away the, anonym, uh, the anonymous part of being able to just write what you think without, um, uh, without showing your name, but it does give them some accountability. And if you want each student to participate, you say, well, you must write at least one response to this and one response to someone else. So this is again, just a taste. Again, I think it's something that you can really uh, dig deeper in. And um, what I'd like to do is, first of all, if there are any comments or questions, if anyone wants to share, um, and now is a good time to ask or to say something about this um, method before we're going to also start to uh, wrap it up and also look a little bit at our Padlet wall, which was another method that can be used. Does anyone want to maybe say something or comment? Okay, so I just want to um, say something about the um, metaphor of the graffiti wall. Um, I think that graffiti, as many of you know, in many situations and cultures, really symbolizes um, a rebellion or some kind of social uh, message that people feel they need to sort of just put out there. And sometimes it, it can even be considered an illegal act that someone spray something on a wall and it can even be considered vandalism. But um, I think these days we know that graffiti artists many times are um, really relaying a message that's important to a lot of people. And in some cities in the world, and maybe some of you can share, there's actually organized graffiti artists um, actually putting up um, graffiti art in different places in the, in the city in order to, to relay messages. And I, um, I think that it's not, it's not a coincidence that after the assassination of Rabin, this graffiti wall was created. And think about it, why didn't the municipality of Tel Aviv paint that wall over and say, you know, this isn't appropriate. This isn't the way we commemorate um, Yitzhak Rabin and this isn't an appropriate kind of behavior. And even more so, why did the National Library of Israel decide to include a photograph taken of that graffiti wall in the National Library, why was that considered one of the um, maybe sources or important um, uh, artifacts from Israeli society at the time? Um, I think those are questions that we can really think about deeply and we can encourage our students to think about. What is worthy of being remembered? What is worthy of being framed and, and put, um, brought to the public and I think uh, one of the big roles of the National Library is to do just that, to preserve Jewish culture in so many different forms. So I think it's just really interesting to also think about that aspect of the graffiti wall and how sometimes negative things that might seem negative are actually actually do have a positive effect. And we see that it's a, um, it's a very complex situation because Yom Rabin itself is about discourse and how sometimes words can become violence. And so we're always, as educators, I think we're always in that really complicated area of when is it right to say enough, this isn't appropriate, and when is it, wow, good for you, you're voicing your opinion, and it's so important, and how do you do that? Um, so really just for, um, I want to I wanna just share with you the, um, the Padlet wall that we sent you in advance. Some of you posted, some of you can post now if you like. This is another way of creating some kind of discussion between people in a group. So here we have the question itself or the topic for discussion. And here, 
different people have posted different things. What's great about the Padlet wall, and as you notice, this is also a little bit like a graffiti wall. Um, people can also respond or like or love something that someone else wrote. They can agree. And again, with learners, with students, depending on their age, we can really encourage them to write a comment um, on each one of the other students' um, posts, or at least respond to two other people in the class or two other people in the group um, and either disagree or agree. It doesn't have to mean you don't, I, I want you to notice that in, on this page, no one wrote a comment and maybe you, you weren't sure you were allowed to, but no one wrote a comment um, that had any pushback um, about the, pe the things that people wrote, which is fine. Uh, we have some likes, we have some support. Uh, the question is, when do we, again, as educators, push our learners, push our students, and also on a personal level, when, when do we push ourselves to really think about what we don't agree with, where we wanna voice our opinion and not just say, okay, I don't agree with that, but I'm not gonna say anything. Um, sometimes it's because we don't wanna confront people. Sometimes it's because we're afraid of maybe what the ramifications will be. Um, I think honestly, from my experience, sometimes we're not really sure what we think and we don't wanna voice an opinion on a topic. We're not convinced um, uh, about, the, about this idea we have and we don't wanna sort of come out with some kind of um, uh, announcement and say, oh, I think this and that, and then we won't be able to support it. But I think, and I see this with younger students, definitely in Israel, um, it's becoming harder and harder um, for some people to have a really solid opinion about things. And at the same time, we see extremists going very far with very extreme opinions. So I, I feel like that's one of our big challenges. And if we go back to the topic of machloket, if we want um, to continue the conversation um, and to have our students be part of the grand conversation, be it about Jewish culture, be it about Jewish history or any other topic, um, we really have to find the ways to encourage them to be part of the discussion, to be part of the conversation and not to shy away from expressing their opinion. Um, so um, I'm gonna go back to our slideshow and um, I'm gonna ask, this is the, the poster, I'm gonna uh, show you all the links. Should we? Yes. Sorry, that there's a happen. question in the chat box. Yes. From Robin. Um, about the Hebrew words of Alimut and Ilim. Okay, so, okay. So on this graffiti wall, we see in red this word Alimim, which means violent people. Um, and it's, it, it might be part of a larger sentence. Alimut in Hebrew is violence. And Ilmut is when someone uh, is mute. They can't speak. They... Um, it's, it basically means silence. And personally, I, I taught Tanakh for many years. I taught Bible for many years. And it, it, to me, goes back to the story of Joseph and his brothers, where it says that they couldn't speak to him in peace. Lo shalom, le shalom, which means it's like they couldn't speak to him. And there was something, there was, there was no communication between Joseph and his brothers. And I feel like that's really an example of when there are no words, sometimes there's violence. When there's, there's no communication, sometimes it results in people acting and doing things that are, um, that, that really are, are an extreme um, violent act that really isn't the right thing to do because they couldn't find the words to, to say what they think. Um, so those are the two words in, um, in Hebrew, and I think that it, in the Hebrew language, I think it's really interesting. A lot of times words that are sort of similar or have a s similar roots, sometimes it also symbolizes certain um, things when it comes to the meaning. So it's always nice to dig into that um, aspect of the words um, in Hebrew. Um, you can also see that on the bottom of Yitzhak Rabin's uh, picture, it says Shalom Chavel, which by the way, we didn't, discuss that at all, but that really became um, the title and the most, um, uh, the, the sentence that's most linked to the assassination of Rabin that Bill Clinton said um, at, the, at the funeral. He said, Shalom Chaver, those were the two words he said, and that became like 
the sticker and the slogan that really um, um, became one of the most central things that people remember um, after the assassination. Um, so here we have, like I said, all the links. We're gonna send you this um, by email so you'll have everything you need. Um, you'll see that this is the lesson plan for Yitzhak Rabin. And we also have some uh, information um, in our blog. And there are other um, general resources here that we really, really encourage you to visit each one of these pages and sort of get to know our resources and see what we have to offer. You'll see that it's um, on many different topics. And of course, in the sessions to come, we'll be touching upon other topics. Um, uh, any questions, any comments at this point? We're also gonna send you now in the chat box the feedback form and we really love to hear from you because this is really just, we're launching this webinar series for you, for educators, and we really wanna be attentive to what people need and want. So we're really happy to learn from you and get your comments. So if anyone has any questions, now's a great time also before we need to end. It was a pleasure seeing everyone. And again, if anyone has any other questions, um, really, you're welcome to write us your comments in the feedback form. You're welcome to email me. Um, and I'm really excited to see you next time, which will be about SIGD. And we're gonna actually also have a, um, a guest speaker for some of the sessions. So hopefully you guys will join us. And if you can recommend this to any other educators you know who you think can benefit from this, uh, really, you're welcome to do so. Um, Lior, do you want to say a few words before we have to part? Just thank you very much, Uvi. That's it for now. Okay, so here in Israel, it's almost 11 p.m., so I guess good night and good afternoon to some of you, and it was great seeing you. Thanks, Juvie. Hi, Carrie. Good Bye. to see you. Thank you so much. Bye.